Hello, everybody. This is GM Desi Cry. I am joined by Sam, Super GM Shanklin below me, and then I am David Proust. And today we are going to talk about the state of U.S. chess. Uh, as you see here, I got a little hand. I'm going to move that hand, and uh, as we go along, basically we're going to give ourselves roughly 10 minutes to talk about each given topic. Uh, maybe we'll be a little faster. But the idea is just to keep us moving. That's how we do this thing, even if it's a little barbaric. But we just don't want people to talk forever. All right. Uh, very interesting. Maybe I'll give, I'll give a very cursory background. Sam can give this uh, more himself. The FIDE World Championships are not taking place. Who knows when they're actually going to take place. The U.S. Championship, however, is taking place. Fabi had to cancel on that. And so the question is, who is going to get dropped for Fabi to come in? And I'm going to start the clock. Is that happening? Or would, like, was there some press release or something? There has not been any press release that I know of yet. But I wrote this topic on the assumption that, you know, they would want to give Fabi a last second um, spot in the U.S. championships now that he doesn't. I don't think he had the option. I mean, what happened was... He declined the invitation to the U.S. championship when it was going to be held in person because it would have conflicted with, I guess, the tournament. I don't know why, but when anyhow, he declined. And so we had a full list of signed contracts, and they just they didn't reissue any invites when the tournament got rescheduled. They just didn't give anybody – they didn't update anything. or They just said, no, we're just, these are legally binding contracts. We just rescheduled the event. The same invitations will hold regardless of schedule changes. Um I don't know. Uh, so you, believe already, that, you believe that even though he's available now, they're not going to kick somebody out to put him in the tournament? No, I don't think so. I mean, I also don't know if he even would want to play. I mean, you, I have no idea what goes through his mind or his decision-making. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, I don't know. Uh, if if he insisted on playing and, wanted, and somebody had to get kicked out and I were St. Louis, I mean, the first people I would go toward would definitely be like... Elshon or Alejandro simply because they're not getting in by rating. And as a result, it's very easy for them because these people would not necessarily be playing any U.S. championships anyway. It's very right. easy to go to one of those guys and say, hey, you're probably not qualifying next year. We promise you right now we will give you the wild card. Like 100 percent, no questions asked. You're playing next year when it's going to be classical and more money if you're willing to, to step out this time. I think that's going to. I think you're more likely to get yes out of guys like them than out of someone like me where I'd say, wait, but I'm going to play next year anyway because I'll qualify. So if they had to kick somebody out, I would think they should kick somebody out where the promise of playing next year would be enough for them to say, okay. While for a lot of the field, that wouldn't necessarily be the case, but I don't think so. I mean, we've had an opening ceremony. We've had drawing of lots. I don't think they're changing anything. Um, just to be clear, how did Elshon and Alejandro qualify? Alejandro is a wild card, and Elshon won the U.S. Open. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, so I think I think ahead. that um, I think that it's Alejandro who's going to get going to get booted in the next day or two. Well, I mean, if so, they'll certainly invite him next year. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's very easy to just tell him, look, we'll we'll just give you the wild card next year instead. I mean, if you have to choose between playing 2020 and playing 2021. When one of them, we're at least hoping, will be in person in like a real tournament, real classical event with more money, I would assume they'd rather play the second one. But again, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that I think they're going to stick with their contracts. What do you think, Jesse? Are they going to stick with their contracts? Well, you know, it's funny. So yesterday I did this interview with John Donaldson about Fisher, and we were just, you know, that's why I got the backdrop. It's kind of cool, U.S. chess, yada, yada. Anyways, so back in the day, you could easily imagine somebody like Fisher, who would have been in Fabi's position, being like, uh, dude, <laughs> I'm coming into play. <laughs> Get out of my way. And then people would have made way for the guy. And of course, that isn't Fabi's personality. Um, but certainly, I think, from the in the interests of the St. Louis Chess Club, they would love to have Fabi in it. Of course, this year's championship, and maybe uh, Sam can speak to this as well, is like, it of course feels totally different, right? This rapid uh, chess tournament that we have going on. And for that reason, maybe Fabi's not that keen on it anyway, uh, though there is some money at stake. 
Um, but I think it's definitely in the interests of the club and everybody involved to have Fabi play. And honestly, for Fabi too, he'd get some good experience. And, you know, he has all this pent up rage that he was going to expend upon this candidate's third of it that he needs to let loose on poor Sam. <laughs> right? I don't know. I mean, in general, with St. Louis, once they've announced something, I've never seen them back out on it. Um, I don't. I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, we'll see. Sam, while we're on the topic, how do you feel about this? Uh, the whole thing about it being rapid, and and yeah, what are your thoughts on the U.S. Championship in general? I mean, obviously, I hate it. I would much rather it be classical. I'd much rather it be in person. But it's a lot better than it not happening at all. And St. Louis has done what they can to make a U.S. Championship happen. Uh, to get, you know, the top players in the U.S. paid, which, you know, is important when you have no tournaments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would I have much preferred if it had been done in person? Of course. Would I have, you know, and it being online and rapid, it's just going to be like, what year was that Olympiad when the U.S. won but nobody played? Which, which, which Olympiad was that? It was sometime in the 70s, right? Uh-huh. It's, it's just, you know, a tournament. It's, it's a real event, like, but... You know, whether it's, you know, when you look at the Wikipedia page it, 10 years down the road, it will have an asterisk next to it, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, um, I don't know. I, I've i never really liked that Rapid is sort of taking over anyway, not just in this tournament, not just with, uh, with, um, with the pandemic, but Rapid was becoming much more important because... One thing that I've found about classical chess is I think there's a very healthy balance between how far talent will get you and how far hard work will get you. Uh, and I think that that balance tilts heavily towards the talented players the faster the time control becomes. And uh, when you get to really rapid games, you can see guys who just don't work all that hard, but for whom chess comes very easy to them. They will succeed in ways that they won't in classical chess. And guys who work very hard to eliminate their shortcomings when the time gets lower that it's not as effective. Uh, so we all know where I believe I lie on that, uh, on that subject. And so on a personal level, I'm not thrilled with it. That said, I think St. Louis chess club has done the best they could given the situation. I'm glad that we have something, you know, and who knows what the world will be like next time. Well, all right. One interesting thing that you, uh, put there, the Sam, it's really interesting. So basically if we see somebody with a, uh, higher, blitz or rapid rating than their regular rating your instant assumption would be that they are more talented than hardworking. that's usually the case for what it's worth most people are reasonably close in their blitz and classical chess right not all but most uh if you have someone who's like notably stronger at classical like me or someone who's like notably much stronger at blitz or rapid that probably is an indication of where you get in terms of talent versus work ethic Interesting. So Fabi would come into that uh, realm, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's, you know, massively talented compared to other guys who have been number two in the world and played for the world championship. You know, he's someone who seems to have mostly gotten to where he is today based on putting in the hours. Um, but also, I think his his rapid skills are underestimated. I think he's a lot better rapid player than people give him credit for, just because. He got smoked by Magnus. I mean, he's certainly not the only person to have been smoked by Magnus, you know. Uh, and it's, I think he's very, very good at rapid as well. I'm going to start pronouncing Magnus like Sam Magnus. That's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> That's my <laughs> attempted Norwegian pronunciation. I'm sure it's totally wrong. No, it sounds pretty good. Even if it is wrong, it's probably right. Okay, let's right. move on our, to the our viewer poll. Our viewer poll was very close on this topic. Oh, okay. Um, 46% guessing that Fabi will somehow get a last second spot in the US champs, 30% mm -hmm. saying no, and 20% saying they don't know. So pretty well, cool. of course, I don't know is actually the answer because nobody actually does know. You're just guessing if you're saying yes or no. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's a game where we try to have opinions. <laughs> right. Well, no, so you I just don't know why you have I don't know as an option. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, Sam, I think Sam made a good point that the St. Louis Chess Club would, it's hard for them to change their mind. On the other hand, ah, that's an interesting, when it comes to Fabi, I think they're willing I've, to make some. I've only ever heard of one person ever getting disinvited from an event so that they could make room for like somebody stronger. It, I mean, when contracts are signed, that's something people respect and St. Louis is honest and they don't, 
I've never heard of them reneging upon a contract. On the other hand, if I was in Elshan's shoes, I'd be, yeah, I don't want to play a rapid. Put me in next year's event. Put me in the next one, boss. Yeah, that would be great. That would be a great deal. Yeah. And Josh says that's despite the fact that they've wanted to disinvite him many times, but they still haven't done it. <laughs> that's right. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. And this is the question. What will the Olympia team look like in five years? Sam, take us did, out of here. Uh, real quick, Jesse, did you yeah. change the order of the topics? Uh, like, only mildly, let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Five years. Uh, it's hard to say. I think Hikaru will be gone, not because I don't believe in his ability to stay, but just because of the choices he seems to make. He just doesn't seem to be that interested in classical chess as more doing lots of rapid and streaming. I think if at any point he decided that he wanted to get back into classical and, and working like seriously hard at it, I think that he would easily stay on the team as is. Uh, I think it's not, I think he's going to be off mainly by his own decision and his own will, as opposed to like being booted off. Um, beyond that, I mean, look, Caruana and So are both still in their late twenties. They're still going to be there. I believe that Dominguez will probably still be on at that point. Um, it would, it would be easy to just say me and Jeffrey, but you never know. One of these kids could come up. You could have another player transfer federations. You never know these things. Um, uh, it just depends a lot, I guess, on, on who switches in the next five years. I think if five years, it's usually not that extreme though. Like for example, I, re I believe you wrote in the topics originally uh, five or 10 years. I think if you take the last 50 years, drop yourself in any moment you wish, ask yourself, what will the U.S. team look like in 10 years? My guess is you're going to get at least one and probably more people who are not presently playing under the U.S. flag at the time that you asked the question. But when you ask what's it going to be in five years, that's usually not the case, I think. Right. Uh, if you ask in so five years, you probably usually get like three people worth of overlap on average. Yeah, probably. Uh, and I don't think that you're super likely to have a ton of guys who had just switched federations and then playing on the team immediately. By the time it's 10 years, it's very likely you're going to have people who at the time of the question are, are not currently playing under the U.S. flag. So it just depends who those people are going to, who's going to switch. But um, for five years, if I had to guess, it will be Caruana, So Dominguez, Jeffrey, and myself. Uh, I, I guess that's sort of wishful thinking on my part because I don't want to get booted. But uh, I would guess that's what it would be. Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly like um, I mean, the main person I would think that they would want to, to buy next would be Ferruja, but he's been without a federation <laughs> for, like, next. for like nine months by now. Right. So like obviously they weren't able to land him quickly. So it's a real big question mark whether or not. Um, well, I mean, who knows? It's, uh, it's you never really know. Like if somebody actually was bought, so to speak. I mean, that's you know, it's harsh terminology. I mean, but he's, he's obviously on the market, right? I mean, he, he needs a federation. I mean, but he's a little different than not anybody else who switched because yeah. he's switching from nothing, having already abandoned his exactly. previous one. Exactly. Uh, but another thing is, it's all. I don't want to go too far into geopolitics, but I'm not. I'm reasonably well informed. But I don't know for certain. Can Iranians actually come to the U.S.? I'm not sure they can. I know that we're. Geopolitically, we're not. We don't have the best relations with them. Sam, um, for Ferruja, we can make it happen. <laughs> we have contacts in high places. We can make it happen. If that I guy wanted know. to come, we could do it. We'll see. But yeah. I don't like to speculate on stuff like that. It's just you know. I guess we'll see. But um, sure, sure, it's hard to speculate. Um, I, I I feel like I've met um, Iranian Americans a couple times. So there must be some, some, well, I know, but it's, it's a recent thing. Like it was, you know, 2016 or whatever, anybody who came before then there was, there was basically no problems whatsoever. It was okay. only since then that I've spoken with some Iranian players who have told me that they can't like come travel to the U S huh. right. So prior to that, there was certainly never any problem. I mean, there were tons of Iranians, like including in our U S championship, Elshan is an Iranian American. Right, Elshan, He's sure. been here forever. You know, there's it's a it's a very recent thing that Iran Iranians have had trouble coming to the U.S. I don't know the exact date or the exact status, but it's yeah, yeah. there's a chess show, not a politics show. Um, yeah, the the thought of Farooja coming hadn't even crossed my mind. Um, 
I and I want to say David loves to say things like we bought them. I don't think we bought them. I don't think I think there was v- great reasons for Lanier to come for So to come, and f- both of them, you know, it in short order. I think are adapting an American sensibility, even if not identity. You know, so I don't think it's just like oh, I'm playing here for money. You know, I really don't. I don't. I think, for example, with So, the fact just that he gets to play on the U.S. Olympia team against super strong opposition, that was a huge motivating factor for the kid. I think, you know, yeah. I mean, there can be all kinds of other reasons as well, Jesse. But I mean, the, I mean, I'm not trying to say it like you go to market and you pick a carrot or anything like that. But, but I mean, there is like a financial component to this, right? There is a financial transaction. They not only like if somebody changes federations, you not only have to pay their home federation a sum of money, you have to pay FIDE an amount of money right. also for your not purchase of, mm-hmm. of the player, right? And I think that a, a, a driving factor in many of these decisions is money. So it's not it's not ridiculous. Though let me just bring into that, which is so one of the most amazing stories to me, is that to avoid paying that fee, Lanier uh, didn't play. For like he had to stop playing for over a year. <laughs> he did. Yeah. What that? What a hardship! What a hardship! And then he came back, and he was still better oh. than ever. It's it's a little bit different because I think the rules are there's no rule saying you can't play tournaments while you're you're waiting to transfer. I think the rule was that he couldn't leave the U.S. while his immigration was, I guess, under review or whatever. I'm not. Again, this is all like geopolitical stuff, but. Uh-huh. Basically, yeah, the premise was all the tournaments that he would have wanted to play were not in America, uh, so he chose not to. But he certainly, I believe, could have gone and played the North American Open if he felt so inclined. Interesting. Um, I, I want to say in terms of five years, to, to me, uh, as especially as, as an old guy looking at what will be another old guy in five years, I mean, Lanier is going to be pushing, I think, what, pushing 40, right? Yeah, but he's he's a very hard worker. I mean... He's not a guy who I think just gets by because he's sharper than everybody else. He has incredibly deep preparation, real class and knowledge to his game. The guys who drop off faster are the ones who are tend to be like the more talented types. And I think Lanier will still be very strong in, in five years. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe Savio and I will have just left him in the dust. It's, it's certainly possible, but I, I don't think so. I'm I'm rooting for him. What do you think? Uh, I know it's hard actually for you, Sam, to, because you're just with these guys all the time. But um, right, uh, yeah. What you just mentioned, Sevion. What do you think of his chances of breaking the twenty seven hundred club soon? Well, oh, is he, is that, is he, are we going to discuss that on number five? <laughs> oh, we can, can discuss it on number five, I guess. But it's just like right when you start adding up this team, right? If you count Sevion, yourself, and Zhang. Oh my God, we we're already no, you're, almost you're there. getting to too many players. People are right. getting cut. Yeah, it's too many players. But I mean, it, for that to happen, it's it kind of a, here's another interesting question. Here, maybe here's a way to put it: What rating do you need to have in five years to even be on the team? About twenty-seven fifty for sure. Twenty-seven fifty, man! Holy moly! You know, I mean, what a especially team! Especially if I mean. Look, Faruja is about to be like top 10 in the world. He's going to get there pretty soon. If, you know, if all of a sudden we have four top 10 players on the team, like that have switched federations to the U.S., how, I mean, how are you not going to, how are you going to make the team with 2730? You're just not going to do it. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, it's going to, I mean, look, our team is getting stronger. I remember when I first qualified for the team, I was 2620. That will, you're like probably something like 10 spaces away now if you have that rating, maybe 15. Oh, yeah, 15. <laughs> no, I was 2640, sorry. But still, it was, it was quite, it's quite a bit. Yeah. So, Sam, later we're going to talk about 2700, will they or won't they? But right. let's just put that in. Let's just imagine it's 2750, right? It's an incredible number. What would you say your chances are of making 2750 in five years? Uh, if, I think if I don't make it in five years, I never will. Um, you know, I'm not that young a man myself. I turned 29 a few a couple of weeks ago. Um, right. I think I can make it. I, I think I was 2750 strength. I still believe I am 2750 strength. I think my rating tanked when both of my parents got sick. I got my heart broken, my hand slashed open, and all a whole bunch of other stuff over the course of 
nine months. Uh, in general, I think I'm, I should be 27, 30. Uh, I think that once I get to play enough classical games, now that my life is in better order, I'll, I'll be back there. I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I'm just way too confident in my own abilities and, and just an arrogant uh, POS, but um, I think I'll make it. We got to believe in yourself. <laughs> you got to believe. Yeah. You got to believe. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, Jesse, what do you think the Olympiad team looks like? What's your What's your answer if you're on the spot five years, name four people in an alternate? And you have five seconds to say it. <laughs> okay. I think Fabi's still there. I think uh, Naka is actually still playing. I think So is still playing. And I think Lanier's still playing. And I think Zhang is the alternate. That's my uh, guess. So I'm gone. All right. <laughs> well, I think I mean it's really even hard to say where's Zhang. Like honestly, even with Lanier too, because I think you're right. I think 2750 is probably the bar, and then I'm not sure as an old guy that that Lanier is going to be able to hold 2750. You look at the amount of people over 2700, over 40, and it's pretty small. <laughs> it's a pretty small list. So you know, that's where I'm at on that. Okay. We got here's, a. Here's, here's my answer. Okay, Jesse, go ahead. Which I never gave my final list, but I think um, that it'll be that uh, I think that Sam Sam's probably right about Naka. So I'm going to go with Bobby and Wesley and Lanier, and then one player whose name we don't know yet, but who's not in the U.S. Federation right now. Mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. So <laughs> okay, one more player who's not in the U.S. Federation right now, who's neither you know. Sam, nor Sam 2, nor Jeffrey, nor anybody like that. And then the fifth spot, I think, will be a close race um, repeatedly, probably back and forth switching year to year between Sam and Jeffrey, because I think they can both make 2750. So I, I really agree that the bar is at 2750 there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right, I'm going to start this next one. This one's a personal one. That I didn't write this, by the way. David, <laughs> David wrote the questions to today. But the U.S. senior is currently ongoing, and it is true that my life basically has no meaning except for the potentiality of me playing cool senior events later on in a couple years, and the U.S. senior is one of them. Personally, I think uh, I have to make 2500 to be in that show. It is possible to qualify via other means, the U.S. Senior, but it's not a guaranteed thing. There's an FM playing right now uh, in the U.S. Senior. Um, I think, you know, I'm doing this show, Road Back to 2500. It is, it is a real struggle. <laughs> it's a real struggle for me to get to 2500. Like Lanier will soon discover, and, and Shanklin, cognitive decline is a real thing, and so elevating my game, uh, it's going to take a lot of work, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So obviously this is the question for Sam and I to answer for you partly, but it, but yeah. obviously you can give an answer too. But yeah, I, um, I, I wrote this topic sort of partly for the fun of us talking about you in front of you. <laughs> 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 and, uh, um, I think that, you know, if we look at the field for this year, it gives a sense of where the bar would be for Jesse to make it into the U S senior. And I don't know exactly how the FM got in, but, for the most part, it looks like, you know, you need a rating of about 2480, 2490, something like that to be in the U.S. senior right now, um, which I think could, could definitely be attainable for Jesse. Um, I think one of the questions that you asked yourself is kind of like, how fast is Jesse going to decline compared to other people declining, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, if we think back like, you know, 15, 20 years ago and compare Jesse to um, guys like, you know, Golden and, and Yermolinsky and I don't, I don't know exactly who else is, is playing, Shab Shabalov and Kaidanov and stuff like that, you mm -hmm. know, at, at their peaks or at their, you know, or in their 30s or whatever, um, I would say, you know, all those players were, were clearly higher rated than Jesse. Um, so the question is, you know, can he decline slower than enough of these other guys um, where before he wouldn't have been in the top 10? And I think Jesse's got uh, pretty good chances of, uh, of doing that. I think he takes good care of his health, relatively speaking, and I think he works hard and, uh, 
And then, I mean, I guess I didn't know this before when I was estimating this, but he says he's got no other purpose in life. That's so, true. I mean, I guess he's, he's got to put everything he has into it. Whereas other people, you know, probably a lot of them have like one or two other things in their, in their lives that matter. So um, I'm going to say yes, barely. I think Jesse's going to be like, you know, the number, the number nine invite or something like that in one of those U.S. senior championships. Okay, so Jesse, are you eligible now or not yet? No, uh, it's going to be, what do I got, a year and a half. Year okay, and a half. so in 2022, you'd be eligible. Well, I will answer this question by asking you a question of my own. How much do you want it? Oh, it's my only purpose in life, Sam. <laughs> I mean, you're joking around. If you actually mean that, I can guarantee you you can win the tournament if you make the right decisions. It has to be said. <laughs> It has to be said that I have other things going on in life, you know, and like, but all these, other, all these other guys do too. So it's, you know, where a lot of us are either I mean, teaching or have a job, you kids, started, you know. Like if you started right now, just like doing the work that I do every day and just like, you know, sorry to your family. We don't, I no longer care about you. And just decided to tunnel zone your, yourself on chess, do the proper work, do the proper fitness, uh, nutrition, everything that I do uh, and that any other, you know, probably serious top player will do as well. And you decide to make that your life for the next two years until the next U.S. senior happens. I think you're the favorite to win it. Uh, that's not something I necessarily recommend you do. I wouldn't recommend abandoning your family. That's not generally a good way to live your life, but um, yeah, with the balanced answer, <laughs> it's all about, it's all about the choice. If, it, if you decide that's something you want to do, I mean, look at these guys, they're not, they're not like super well booked up or anything. They're all playing a bunch of sidelines. If you spend 40 hours like preparing with modern engines, working hard, busting every single sideline, specifically sidelines, not just main lines, to the point where you're just crushing it every single time, you know, go to the tournaments on your own or with a second, not with your family, uh, have very strict routines, don't socialize, don't drink during the event, nothing of the sort. Uh, I think you'll just be at a huge competitive edge to the point that it almost guarantees victory. Uh, that's not going to be the case in terms of like the U.S. championship where everybody does that. But in a U.S. senior, I think that you can almost guarantee victory if you decide to make the decision to do it. Well, that's, that's good. That's a good inspirational speech. And actually, you know, at some point, uh, I think it would be great to have you on, Sam, just to talk about your training regimen. I think people – I would yeah, be interested sure. in that and other people would be interested in that too. Yeah, I mean I'm happy to do that whenever. I think one of the things, okay, I'm going to just speak a little bit and then you guys can bust on me some more, um, <laughs> that um, one of the, the couple things to just observe about the field is some people are going to crash and burn of the old timers, like like Christensen's dying this time around. The guy's totally dying. He, uh, and, and maybe that's just a fluke, but that's the kind of guy I can imagine, you know, a guy who was once number two in the U.S., international competitor that's the kind of guy i can imagine just not being able to keep up mentally you know and, and it's just going to happen it's going to happen to everybody it's just a question of when but anyways there's that that's just kind of interesting to observe and also i was part of a group where there was uh, very few GMs created anywhere around me. So, like, I was the first GM in, like, since Maurice Ashley. So, from 2007 to 1996. And Maurice Ashley, I don't think, even was officially American. You know, he was born in Jamaica. And he, or, I mean, he's American now, but he was born in Jamaica. But anyways. He learned chess in the U.S. Right. But I'm just trying to say, like, there's not that many people going to come into the ranks in the next couple of years. And I, I think, like, for example, Malik will join. But Malik just had twins, too. <laughs> I was thinking somebody who just had kids, man. I don't know. It's very difficult. Uh, Malik, I think, will be eligible this coming year. Uh, so, right. Anyways, the amount of people coming in is not that much into the U.S. senior Sounds like Jesse's done some research, at least. On like, I, I, you know, I just kind of, who cares? <laughs> just kind of thought about it. You know, I just say too that the interesting thing about it is, I want to play chess, but I don't want to play terrible open tournaments like the Goichberg tournaments. And honestly, the Goichberg tournaments might just disappear because of this COVID thing. It's too nasty as it was. And I just want to play some cool events. And there's so it's not just 
the U.S. Senior, but there is the U.S. Senior Team. I think that would be really fun. And then the, the World Senior, of course, right? Oh. And the, those three events, that would be enough for me. <laughs> I could just organize my life around if, those if three events. If that's the only events you're going to play, you're probably not going to win the U.S. Senior. You need to be playing with stronger players. I mean, if you no, play I... like really strong European Opens and mm -hmm. just get used to playing with 2,600 guys, you know, these guys will seem like a piece of cake. No, I, I'm I'm with that. I'm just saying I don't I, I want to have an old age dotage where I'm not playing the terrible opens and more. You know, maybe me and Proust and Kosti will go to Iceland and play in what, Reykjavik or yeah, something. What's terrible? I and mean, Beal is really nice. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm just talking about the tournaments you I, I've been playing the last couple of years in the United States. I really don't enjoy them. You know, the, yeah, the typical. Know, I haven't played a Goichberg event. In eight right. Years. Yeah. Um, who's leading at the moment? I think Benjamin's in second, and then uh, somebody can. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I know Novikov, the great Novikov. Really? He drew plus today and took first place alone. That he's at like plus one or something, you know. I would have expected Shabalov and Kadanov to be at the top, but I guess what do I know? And uh, last year was really cool. Uh, Josh Fridell, who's in the chat, was the second for Golden. And Golden and, you know, all those guys are really, they have a lot of chess culture, man. They know a lot of things. And, Wait, uh, Josh got to be the second for Golden? Yeah. But That's the problem so is chess, <laughs> chess culture doesn't really get you that far against guys who also have chess culture. If you want to set yourself apart from that group, you have to be able to just be incredibly merciless, merciless with the tactical punishment whenever the slightest oversight comes. Um the, I mean, none of these guys playing now are people who are strategically going to make big mistakes. They're, a lot of them are Soviet-grown. The ones who aren't also got to play with these guys. Uh -huh. They have a very good fundamental understanding of chess. That's something that seniors do. Uh, when you play very strategically against them, you know, the guy who plays a little bit better than the other might not win. It might just be a draw. Uh, I think if you want to win the U.S. senior the best thing you could do is just be spamming the tactics and really make sure that you're calculating really, really well. Or even like really well for an old guy. <laughs> really well for an old guy, yeah. Might be enough. All right, so uh, next up, I, I told Carissa that I'm going to be mean to her, but I don't know if she's watching, so we'll see. She was on earlier. Okay. She was on earlier. Carissa, are you in the chat so I can insult you in front of your face? <laughs> like, I don't want to waste an insult you when you're <laughs> We, we can start with Burke and then get to Yip if you want to. Okay, Carissa's watch. here. He's watching. Um, yeah, so both of these two are very promising young players. Um, I don't really know their games that well. I, I mean, I know Carissa personally a little bit, not super well. I've never actually met John Burke. Um, it's so, but again, what I would say is much like it is with Jesse, I think it comes down a lot more to the choices that you make than it will to how far you've come so far in your life or have, or, or what you've done so far in your career. Um, I think that one thing, I mean, again, I don't really know Carissa that well, but one thing that I think speaks very well for her is she's very well-rounded. She seems like somebody who, who went to school, who is still going to school as far as I know, has oh, a relatively yes. normal American upbringing. And that I think will, she comes across as a happier person than, a lot of the people I see who are just full-time chess. And that I think can really make a big difference. A lot of the really, really good players that we know is um, are like really tunnel zoned on chess. We think about the absolute best players. As far as I know, Fisher was the only world champion who was one dimensional. Every other world champion had something else in their life that interested them, something else that made them tick, you know, wasn't, you know, not, I'm not saying all of them were road scholars, but they, didn't just drop out of school at age, you know, 12 or whatever. They, they became, you know, people of the world to some degree, understood things, the world was bigger than chess. That's something that I think will serve Carissa well. Uh, but it's also, it, it shows a lot that she's the best female junior in the United States, even considering that she's going to school with all this stuff. Um, that shows that she has the work ethic and the talent needed to get that far, but also that she has the healthy lifestyle that will complement it. So, so, think, so, Sam, you think early on somebody who's well-rounded could get outpaced by some yes, talented think, kids who, like, quit school and stuff like that, but then, yeah, like, I five years down the road, they get out. 
they get outpaced oh, yeah. by somebody who has the balance in their life to keep fighting. And they get outpaced by people who have started earlier. I mean, this was my life my whole time. Uh, you know, I, w- I started late and I went to school. I mean, both of these were supposed to be utterly crippling handicaps. But I think in a lot of ways it helps me because I was um, uh, I always played for the love of the game. You know, it was never like it never once crossed my mind that, oh, I don't have any options other than to play chess. I'm not enjoying myself, but I'm going to play and study more, even though I'm not happy right now. You know, I did it because it never really it was something that I truly loved. Now, there were times in my life where, you know, chess really hits hard. And when you love a game that much, when you love anything that much and it crushes you like that, it's not easy. But uh, in general, I think people who have made it really far when chess was not their only option in life, that shows a lot of promise. Uh, so, but again, you know, as much as glowing praise as I could give Paris or anyone else, it is going to come down to her choices much more than anything else, uh, much more than how talented she is, how far she's gotten so far today. If she decides to, you know, really want to work hard on chess to become the best player she can be and then does the right things to make that happen, I expect her to get very strong. If she decides not to, you know, do chess that seriously or doesn't make the right decisions on how to train or whatever, she's just going to fade into obscurity. It all comes down to decisions uh, and the decisions you make. Uh, As for John, uh, this... Look, everybody is going to think I'm just glowing about everyone and think everyone's a genius. Trust me, that's not the case. I have never said this before in my life. John has impressed me more than any American junior I've ever seen. And it is because he has gotten to where he is. uh, Not only, basically the way I see it, there's generally two categories of chess players growing up. People who have had a lot of opportunities and people who haven't. And I'm not saying people who have had a lot of opportunities and got really strong don't deserve it. They do. I mean, a lot of people who have had opportunities don't make it. And just because you've had opportunities does not mean you're a lesser person when you succeed. But what I can tell you is people who don't have opportunities and make it, they impress me more. And furthermore, John is in a category of his own because people actively wanted him to fail in a way that I've never seen any other junior. And it was because of some incident a long time ago that was not his fault. He ended up rating 2,600 when he was 12 years old. All because of this stupid K40 in the FIDE factor. And he had this gross inflated rating. But essentially what happened to him then was he was 2,200. He made this jump to 2,600 thanks to the stupid FIDE rating system at the time. And people were like, oh, overrated kid, overrated kid, not fair. He doesn't deserve it, blah, blah. And he got a lot of hate. But what they don't realize is that while he shouldn't have been 2,600, he did earn 2,400 based on his results. There's no doubt about it. And you're 2,400 at 12 years old and everyone's hating on you. Oh, you're he's overrated. You shouldn't get invited anywhere, blah, blah, blah. That's actually like a huge negative stigma behind him. He got really treated badly in terms of a lot of invitations. People assumed he was just totally overrated when it was really, you know, not so much that he shouldn't have been invited. He got really screwed in a lot of ways and he still prevailed. He still became a grandmaster. He still became a U.S. junior champion, overcame that level of adversity starting from when he was 12 years old. I would have just quit chess if I had adults like, you know, insulting me when I was 12, you know, and I was suddenly a piece of controversy. I would have just quit the game. It's mind blowing to me that he was able to keep going. And it really shows a profound love for the game, a huge level of commitment. I've never seen an American junior who impressed me more than that. Um, cool. I mean, I think he's going to be really, really good. Um, David, I'll just share quickly. Uh, so last year I was doing commentary there for the junior. And that year, Sevian and Zhang didn't even play. They were like, these kids aren't even good enough for us, you know. Um and one of the things that I felt talking to both the women, the girls, and the boys was that there was a lot of talent, but that for the most part, these people were not uh, all in on chess in their soul. That uh, they were afraid to jump uh, in terms of saying, okay, because when you when you go all in, then that's your identity and you can't hold on to something else. So they were all holding on to school dreams. And in addition to Burke, I would just want to mention, I think a Wonder Liang is amazing. I think Nicholas Cheka is amazing. And, and Burke is in that league too. And none of them, though, I, when I talk to him, 
didn't seem like they were all in at all. And so these are all very talented kids who had a lot of opportunities that, that we didn't have because of the internet so they can improve, but they're not all in. And when you think about like, let's say making, <laughs> making something amazing like the Olympiad team, well, you got to be like a Jeffrey Jean, man. You got to go full but, but, all in. Jesse, I think it, it says a lot more when somebody goes all in based on their own decision. Rest assured, there's not a single 12-year-old in the world who went all in on chess because it was their decision. It was their parents' decision. When somebody makes that decision on their own and it hasn't been made for them, they are going to prevail. Uh, now, these people are still young. I don't know. John is 17 or something. I mean, he's still not old enough to make that decision. He's still going to be living under his parents' roof. You know, I made that decision on my own, and I think that's largely why I prevailed. Okay, no, that's that's a fine answer. I'm just saying, you know, when I judge young adolescents and uh, I see a lot of talent, but then I don't see the commitment, and maybe John might be different than a Wonder Liang and Nicholas Cheka, because those guys, I think, for sure they're not going to make it. I just think for sure they're both great. But they're not pushing it. Maybe John's different. But I'm no, just thought the same about me once upon a time. <laughs> well, we could talk about that too. We're gonna to talk about under the biggest surprises. I put that under there always okay. Because you are one of my biggest surprises. Yeah. Um, and you know, actually I want to give David a, a, the last word here, but with Carissa and the other girls similar, similar. And I feel my guess is that there is gonna come a young lady soon who is going to go all in and she's going to rip that field apart and she will have a lot of advantages if she wins say the the u.s girls and the u.s women just financially that is a lot of money on the table waiting for any young woman ready to just seize it just seize it and i think right i think really? that i think that girls field yeah there's going to come somebody's going to come along sooner than later David, I'm sorry. To, um, take more time if you need it to finish this off. So, so you mean that person is not around yet? They're not around yet, but they're going to come, yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm largely in disagreement with you on a lot of these, Jesse. But again, based, it's it would be very strange if based on my own life, given my own experiences, it would be very strange if I subscribe to the belief that if you're not all in at age 13, you're not going to make it. Or if you're not one of the top at age 13, you're not going to make it. I would have a hard time justifying my own existence. David, do you want the last word? Sure, sure. Here are my here are my answers on the two. So, um, so John Burke, I had to do some research to try and figure out, you know, his story a little bit because I just haven't seen him play that much. And um, what what I concluded was that he that that he just didn't seem to actually like you know. I don't know. He, he it, it looked to me like he hadn't put in that much um, like time, effort, and, and play over over the last couple of years. It seemed to me like he was probably like amazingly talented, had some like great results, and didn't like care about it that much. And this is really really guesswork on my part, but you know, I saw. I mean, obviously there was that rating jump to like twenty six hundred at some point, and obviously, as Sam says, there was a lot of uh, you know, negative stuff um, going on from other people projecting their jealousies, which a lot of chess players are doing all the time. You know, anytime a good junior or a good female comes along, you, you find some jealousies. And if, if, you know, you've got some reason to complain about their rating or something like that. Yeah. I can, I can imagine people are all after him. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I, I mean, I see, I see the rating he had and it just looked to me like on, on FIDE and his rating history, like he just didn't play that many games. He didn't like pound or grind for mm -hmm. the GM title or like a higher or, or, or anything like that, or like pushing himself. So I figured that um, chess was something that he was like really good at, but probably didn't care about that much. I mean, that said, you know, we all kind of love chess to different degrees. So it's like, you know, just how much of a madman we each are or mad woman, but um. But I, I, my conclusion was, you know, he's going to enjoy playing chess. He's going to be like somebody who can just be like a GM, like without any, without any huge troubles, I guess, relatively speaking. But I don't see him like fighting for, you know, the Olympiad team or 2700 or anything like that. Right. We'll have to see. Um, but just, just like it is for Carissa, it will come down to the decisions he makes. 
Right. I think he has yeah. a lot of potential. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I would agree that at the age he's at, he could still make decisions. You know, I'm just sort of like guessing off the very small amount of data I was able to glean on the internet mm -hmm. um, in about 35 seconds. <laughs> and uh, my conclusion was that up to now, he, he doesn't show the kind of like motivation in, and interest that would correspond to eventually being, you know, one of the top a um, couple players in the U.S. Um, moving on to Carissa, um, oh, I I see and hear a lot more of her um, in like chess news. Um, and my impression is that she that she does have the proper blend of you know talent, motivation, hard work, interest, passion, you know roundedness, everything. I think I think she's got everything to uh, you know win the U.S. Women's Championships for several years and uh you know become a, a a strong grandmaster so i see a lot of potential for carissa to be the person that, that jesse was kind of referring to who isn't around yet i see i see chris as that person i think she's ready to just you know win a lot of tournaments cool uh quick quick, quick question from the chat what about brandon jacobson brandon jacobson another guy that guy's like going to yale at age 16 or something not all in that guy's really talented all right, let's if go. He's, if he's, okay, never mind. On the other hand, go. that means school's out of the way sooner. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. School's out of the way sooner. <laughs> okay, let's start the next one. Um, maybe I'll just introduce this by saying oh, five and six are a little bit related because guessing whether someone will make 2700 relates to oh. the prejudices that you had or maybe things you got wrong in the past of, of the biggest surprises. Uh, that happened either, you know, not making it or making it. Um, so, uh, 2,700, will there or won't they? Have either of you guys ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty? No. Well, there's a scene where uh, Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey, he's given been given God powers and people are praying to him and he has to answer their prayers. And at some point he gets tired of it and he has a little button that says, answer all, yes. I'm going to click that button, answer all, no. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Um, He's saying in all seriousness, the odds of any individual player making 2,700 are low. Right. Most 2,500s don't make 2,550. Most 2,550s don't make 2,600. Most 2,600s don't make 2,650. Go on and go on and go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're gonna we're gonna throw like I'm gonna throw like ten names at you, Sam. All right. Let's see. Typically, one of them's gonna make it. I mean, uh, I'm sure so, somebody will. Uh, I just think that any event. individual person's odds are not great. All right. All right. Let's hear this. Let's Jesse, hear these names. Ready for the lightning rounds? I'll throw out names, and you and Sam can each say a yes or no. Okay. And if you want to, like, you can, you can, you can explain uh, oh, uh, in a little bit of words, but we'll try and get through a few people. Sure. Um. Okay. All right. So I'll start with Ray Robson. He needs about fourteen rating points. Fourteen only. His twenty six eighty six. Something like that. Twenty six eighty. I don't know. All right, Sam. You go first, and I'll go second in these rounds. Oh man. Just, I'm going to pass on this one. He's my Olympic teammate. Ooh, I'm going to say no. All right. Uh, all right. Next, next one, David. Next one. All right. So the answer, the answer is a pass slash all no and a no. All right. Second one up, Sam Sebion. Yes. I don't know. I mean, I think his odds are better than most people, but again, it's all no. I just say like no to literally everybody. <laughs> I mean, I think Savian's odds are as good as literally anyone else's, but like, <laughs> like there's no player with his rating who I think is more likely than him, but I still think against any individual, the odds are not in their favor. All right. Okay. Um, a Wonder Liang. No. I, I already did my reply all answer. <laughs> We're not even going to pause to see what <laughs> to see if you want to revise okay, it. Show me someone who's two six nine nine. I mean, but you know what I mean. All right, I'm going to have to come up with somebody like that to to trip you up. Um. All right. Um. But continuing on with with American players for now, of whom none are rated twenty six ninety nine. Um. We'll go next to John Burke. No. I don't know. I would say no. Okay. Um, Carissa, yet? No. Nope. 
Chris, you. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be wrong about one of these people statistically, but the best guess is always no. All right. All right. I'm going to take one non U.S. player just to test uh, Sam's approach. Um, Predke. I don't know who that is, so I'll say no. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm saying the name wrong, but Alexander Predke. I wouldn't mean I'll be the last U.S. player to cross 2,700. Jeffrey crossed it after me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say no. He's a Russian rated 2696. Oh, okay, then if he if he's only if he's literally one game away, then yes. Fine. Then then what what do you want to go with? Oh, I will say yes if he is literally one game away. I mean, he's at an outlier rating. Maybe his rating's inflated. He just gained 20 points. Okay, but it, even then, like just if he randomly gets lucky next game, I mean, no. If you're 2696, you can make it. That's just you're basically saying, well, he will that be his peak rating for the rest of his life? Right. That that is kind of yeah. All right, Jesse, you got any other Americans that we should throw into this list? Hans Neiman. Neiman's nope. not going to make it. Nope. Um, let's. I think we need to mention uh, Christopher Yu. I think I want to mention Christopher Yu. I asked. I asked Christopher Yu. You already know him. Oh, I'm sorry. I think. Oh, right. You said it right after Chris Yip. And I was like confused. <laughs> I said Chris Yip. Chris Yu. For all these people, I'm saying no to. By the way, I'm trying to inspire you to prove me wrong. Mm -hmm. I would be delighted to eat my words for all of you. Uh huh. Right. I want you to succeed. I will help you succeed. All right. Hans Neiman, Sam. Nope. No, that's Young Ludwig Hammer. Who? <laughs> Young Ludwig Hammer. He's already been 2,700. <laughs> He's training again. He's training, He's training again, again yeah. Training. He's training again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say no. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyone I left off the list, Jesse? No. No, no, I think that's a pretty good list. You know, and I, I'll say, just to emphasize, I think, um, where I'm with Sam is how hard it is, is... I did commentary at several tournaments in St. Louis where Jeffrey Zhang was playing and the kid was battling at like 2680, 2690, and he had to be playing guys who were like 2600. So he had to crush them like most of the time. And most of those tournaments, he wasn't making progress. And it was, I mean, it's just clearly a brutal struggle. And then, you know, kind of like making the GM title, there's no no magic uh, forest appears for you when you make 2,700, but it is definitely like a huge psychological uh, barrier and making it is totally hard. We roughly, you know, on average, there's about 40 some guys uh, who are over 2,700 at any given moment. And most of them go down after they make it. They don't stick around. I mean, Sam can talk about that. It's very difficult to, to stay above 2,700. There's like a natural gravity pulling you down. Um, so to me, when I think about making 2,700, Jeffrey Zhang is like a great example of someone who really fought you know, yeah. to, and gave up basically. Now, I wouldn't even want to say he gave it up. I mean, he gave up everything. He, the kid, loves chess. He, he'll gladly stick around and study the games and study with you at the St. Louis Chess Club forever. You know, so yeah, that kid, beautiful, and that's what yeah, it takes. I mean, Jeffrey and, and I were both stuck in the mid to high twenty six hundreds for four years, and most people get stuck there for longer or per, usually indefinitely. Um, but. Yeah, it, it definitely, it takes a huge amount of grit to break through, a huge amount of fabricating winning chances in a very drawish game in its nature against guys who just make somewhat fewer mistakes than the elite guys. As to staying, it's really a function of what you're invited to. I mean, I stayed for, you know, not only did I stay, I made it to 2730 um, when I was getting invited to good events. And then when, uh, you know, when I got excluded from the FIDE Grand Prix at the last minute and then when a couple of tournaments I was expecting a chance to play up. I ended the, up the top seed and my hand got slashed open and I had to play like that. Uh, at some point I ended up playing 40 uh, games in a row against low rated opposition. That's basically impossible to stay. Right. Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. It was 40. 
So, I, I, I mean, I know I, I, I obviously kept tabs on that and I agree with you, but are you saying that basically even somebody who is over 2,700, if you make them play 40 games against hungry 2,650s, they're going to... Well, or 2,600s, but yeah, they're almost certainly going to drop. Like if I picked, if I picked like, you know, 10 players right now at random between 2,700 and 2,720 and they had to play down 40 times in a row, they'd lose a few points. I would, I would be shocked if any of them stayed over 2,700. Yeah. Uh, It's basically impossible. It's not even, it's the biggest thing is that chess is a drawish game. You can outplay somebody and still not win because there's a huge potential for the game to end in a draw. I mean, you think about the amount of material you can be up and the game still ends in a draw. It's like, I mean, imagine if basketball, you had to beat somebody by 10 points or it doesn't count. It'd be a huge number of draws, a huge number of a better team drawing a weaker team. And the, you're just, you're basically done for if you have to play. I mean, chess is a rigged game against the higher rated player. And if you're the higher rated player every time, it's a rigged game against you. If you're the higher rated player half the time, then you're, you know, you're given a fair shot. And when I, I was I never thought of that. When poor, I was poor playing Magnus. top events, when I was when I was still getting invited, and you know I was in the middle of the field, or I'd get to play up, play up a bit, play down a bit. You know, it was it was effort, but the overall trend was up, and I got up to twenty seven thirty. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, something that might serve as a bridge about to the next one uh, is I'll just say to conclude that. Christopher Yu I, comes to mind as like the the one who really might make it, um, and he's got you know obviously a couple years to go, and that's mostly just my intuition. You know, I did a couple camps with him when he was very young, like six or seven, and uh, very impressive, very capable of solving problems, very difficult problems, quickly doing calculation very accurately, and. You know, uh, Neil Bruce and other chess improvers are, are out there and saying, like, anybody can do it. And, you know, I've seen a lot of kids come up and there are very few kids and you get them when they're like six or seven and they can just just roll through difficult uh, tasks, you know, and it's a very special ability and very few have it. So anyways, he is a person I think definitely has the raw ability. Plus, he's gone all in. His dad has gone, gone all in. It hasn't been as smooth in the last couple of years, as I'm sure he had expected it to be. So it's a very interesting question whether or not he's going to make it. Anybody who expects to just cruise through to GM 26, 2700, <laughs> no, you're, if you really think you're going to do that, frankly, you're an idiot. I mean, come on. <laughs> you hear that, Neil Bruce? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Fabi, Fabi Cruz, dude. Fabi no, Cruz. He, didn't. he was yeah. stuck at 2650 for some years at some point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 2650. He when also like grew 14. up in Europe, which helped tremendously. Very much. Okay, let's start the next one. And I guess we could, I, I allowed this, you could take this biggest surprises wherever you want, but I was just thinking more, and for me, it's the biggest surprises of p- players who either didn't make what you thought they were going to do or made it when you didn't think they were going to make it. And I'll start this thing. And maybe I'll just I'll just eat humble pie right now. <laughs> I'll just eat the humble pie right now. I didn't think Sam was gonna make it, dude. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> you are not alone. No, I didn't think so. And just to put it in context, yeah, it was it's remarkable actually to think back on. So this is basically ten years ago at the GM house, and um, you had uh, at that time like Robert Hess, and you had. Ray Robeson and and Lenderman. and Lenderman and those guys were really shining. Sam was rated much lower, and those guys had all had uh, let's call it chess privilege. Especially someone I feel like Robert Hess, growing up in New York City, getting taught by Miron Cher. You know the whole the whole nine yards. He had everything, and he had the talent too. Um, so at that point, it did not seem like. He, if you had asked me about 2,700, I probably would have given Sam's answer, like, not likely. But anyway, so I want to begin just there by admitting that I was totally wrong about Sam. For what and, it's worth, I remember a long time ago, right around 2010 or maybe early 2011, yeah. like before I got third that U.S. championship and left the, all three of those guys in the dust, um, there was a, a poll on Susan Polgar's blog 
of those four players, the one we just mentioned, myself, Robson, Hess, and Lenderman, yeah. who will make it the farthest? And yeah. I got one vote <laughs> because right. I voted for myself. Well, and one interesting thing about chess improvement that I'm sure we'll have occasion to talk about in other shows is just the, this interesting thing that Sam, actually all three of us started late according to chess wisdom, right? Sam, we were all around 12, basically. Right when it got kind of serious, so I was eleven when I played my first event. Right, and then you know Christopher, you starting at like five, dude. He's starting at five, and so it's a totally different, you know, change. It would be a it's a change of paradigm, honestly, if you start thinking that people who start at twelve can make it. You know, well, it you know times have changed among other things. Like it was easier to come back from that when I was you know. When thir- the top 13 year old in America was 2200 when I was young, or maybe 2300, you know, you can catch up to that a bit easier than you can when, like, they're almost a grandmaster. Um, times have definitely changed, but, uh, you know, it's normal for every generation to have a lot more opportunities than the previous ones. I'm sure I had a lot more opportunities than you guys. The guys who are young now certainly have a lot more opportunities than guys like Jeffrey or whoever are just growing up who had a lot more opportunities than me. You know, every single generation always has more opportunities. So it's not that surprising when they're a lot stronger, a lot younger. But, you know, I was always playing catch up, but I always got there. I always made progress. I always kept my eye on the, on the prize. Um, I don't think a late, I think a late start is a handicap, but not a crushing one. Yeah. But according to your own system, Sam, if you went back 10 years ago and we asked you, you know, is Lenderman going to make 2,700? Is Sam going to make 2,700? Yeah, I would have said, said no to all four. You would have said no to everybody, including yes, yourself, right? Like, including myself, yes. Yeah. I never, I didn't think I could make it. Right. You I had... chose to see if I could anyway and just work as hard as I could and see what would happen. Now, as it turns out, I did make it. Uh, a big part of that was running into Jakob at the right time. But no, I mean, it's one thing that I do think is very helpful in this is what I can talk about chess in America is I think that it's very hard to be a poor person playing chess in America. I think it's really hard to get better. But when I was very young, you sort of had to be rich or not maybe not rich, but reasonably well off or have mm. from a well-off family to have any kind of opportunities. And now I think the obviously you're going to have somewhat better chances if you're rich, but middle-class versus wealthy, I think the gap in opportunities is not particularly significant uh, in American chess when it really used to be, that was the case. Well, it's still very tough if you're actually like struggling, but Okay, I want to go down my quick list, and you guys can if you want, but I'm going to give my biggest surprises kind of in the last decades or so. So uh, the people first that I was wrong about, I started with Sam. The other big one was Naka. I didn't, at various points, you know, he made a couple jumps. I didn't think, and why there was a prejudice against playing Blitz all day. (laughs) That was my prejudice, and a lot of other people felt the same way. They were like, if this kid is going to be playing Blitz all day. He's not going to make it. I give a lot of credit to Weir Mentry, his stepdad. But in any case, it was just very surprising. And then the final jump where he made it in the top 10, I really didn't see it coming. And I was frankly astonished. Um, I was also surprised in the other direction. I really felt, let's take it back to like 2007. I felt that um, uh, Ray Robeson was going to make it. He was just a young kid then. He was destroying everybody. He had all the right resources. Ray got really good. Yeah, no, Ray was an amazing talent. and He's, still, he's really good now. He got to 2680. He's right. And, and, and it's just this bizarre thing, you know, it's not bizarre, but it's a cruel world where 2680 is, of course, an amazing feat. And the guy is working very hard, but, uh, you know, crossing that 2700 and beyond which was kind of indicated at that time. In 2007, you would have said this kid is going to be at the top of U.S. chess, honestly. That's the way it looked in 2007. So I was wrong about that. Among players who were playing for the U.S. in 2007, is what number like three or four now? Is Hikaru, me, Jeffrey, and that's it? Yeah. I mean, I, I still, I mean, I don't think your prediction was necessarily wrong. I think Ray got really, really good. Anyways, I'm just saying I thought he was going to be out there playing with the Magnus Carlsons of the world, and I was wrong about that. Um, and I also think I, – I, I didn't think – I didn't know about Robert Hess, but I definitely thought he was going to go further. 
So I was wrong. Well, Robert, it was just his decision. I think he still could go further, but he just decided not to. He hasn't. I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. He's played one tournament in like four years. Yeah. Anyway. And yeah, as Josh is pointing out, Ray can still improve. He's what? We're talking about him like he's, his career is over. He's he's 26 right now. He's three years younger than me. He, can, he certainly can still improve. And of course. We're, yeah. not, we're not saying his career is over, but you and Jesse said he wasn't going to make 2,700. <laughs> I didn't say that. Jesse said that. I declined to answer for him. You declined he said to answer. all no, plus you declined to answer for him. If your answer were yes, I don't see why you would have declined to answer. Um, I... I was the one posing the question there, but I would say that I think that Ray can make 2,700. But I would also say going back to that poll, um, cause I agree with a lot of the points Jesse's making actually, which I guess shows, you know, group think, right? Maybe we lived in the same house and mm. gradually had the same stupid opinions about everything. But um, when I, um, I, I would say, and I didn't vote in Susan Polgar's blog cause I never go to her blog, but um, in that poll where Sam was the only one who voted for himself, in the defense of all the people who voted wrongly, I also, I would have voted that Sam could, could make it uh, the furthest, but I really had high expectations for Hess and Robson also. And I, and I can say having like played with Robson around age 13 or so and like analyzed with him mm -hmm. and the same with Jeffrey when Jeffrey was about 13 and analyzed with him. I got a very, very similar feeling from both of them. I had a very, very similar feeling from both of them. And I, I think that, I think that Robson, you know, definitely has it in him to make 2,700. Um, I, I don't think that, um, and I don't think that it would be stupid for somebody to have voted that they thought that Robson or Hess might make it the furthest. And Hess, I think would also be 2,700. I'm the opposite of Sam. I'm like all guessing instead of all knowing, but but I'm only picking out, you know, three or four names out of like 10 million chess players in the U.S., right? But right. I think that Hess also could have made 2,700 if he hadn't stopped playing. And I was like shocked and disappointed when he stopped playing. Right. Because um, I was like, no, man, like, you know, you're so good. You're so close. And I remember like seeing him at a tournament shortly before he stopped playing and he was having like one bad result. And I heard him making comments about how he would never be good and, uh, like some very, very like depressed comments about the results of this one tournament. And I was really, really surprised because I really thought like, dude, it's just like, you know, you have like three bad days, you're socializing too much with your friends at this, at this one tournament or something. Cause you know, he was saying these negative comments to a big group of his friends, you know, I was like, you know, there's no, there's, there's nothing but yourself to stop you from becoming, you know, a top 10 uh, GM in the U S or, or top five or six, maybe at the time, you know, we didn't have, Oh, come on. Robert's played on an Olympic team. If you've been on the U S Olympia team, you are by definition, one of the top five GMs in the U S. Right. So I, I just, I, I was just shocked at those comments. I, I, I think that anyone who thought that he or Robson could go the furthest, it's not stupid, right? It's just no, not at all. That kind of potential. No, I mean, they, they didn't make dumb guesses by any stretch. It's just, it was amusing to me that nobody thought it was going to be me. Yeah. Uh, and I, I actually, some people might be discouraged by that. I just took it as motivation. I mean, prove the haters wrong, right? Like right. That's so, locker room. You know, if it. anybody out there is listening, is like, oh, my God, Sam just uh, said I couldn't make 2,700. Make me eat my words. By all means, I'll be delighted for you. I'll be the first one to congratulate you when it happens. Yeah, uh, I'll, print out, I'll print out a piece of paper which says, David, semicolon, will Ray Robson make 2,700? Sam Shanklin, no, period. I, then, I didn't say that, though, was the problem, so that wouldn't Yeah, work. but I'm going to write that on a piece of paper anyway. And when he makes 2,700, he can give you that piece of paper, and you can eat the paper. Yeah, oh, sure, there you go. Now, <laughs> I still remember we had a paper on the fridge for Jesse. If you think this position is equal, why play chess? <laughs> I still remember that piece of paper. <laughs> That's funny. Actually, I want to throw in two other names just came back to me. Uh, Darwin Yang. I th I thought that kid was good. I don't know if he was going to make 2,700. I don't even know I don't know what happened to that kid. I'm surprised. That, but, again, for him, it wasn't that he tried and failed. It's that he chose to go to school and take a different route. But, you know, I think a lot of these kids, too, I'm going to say in Robert's case, for example, uh, the reason he chose 
not to do it is because he had some hard setbacks. He, ex, you know, and you need positive reinforcement to do it. And so- I don't think that's really why. I think it's because he understood why he was failing and it wasn't something, I mean, you'd have to ask him, of course, I'm sure he'd know mm. better than anybody, but from my understanding of Robert, I think he understood what he needed to do to be a top player and did not want to have to do all that opening work, all the nitty gritty technical stuff. You know, when you look at intuition, practical play, I mean, there was nobody better than him at that rating. He was, that's what made him the player he was. Um, but uh, he didn't want to do all the all the opening grunt work. He liked that idea that he could just go and play a game and be creative on his own. And he felt like it was some kind of dishonesty towards the game. And it sucks that you can prepare with the computer. And he hated that. Like, I remember, like, the look on his face when we played in the U.S. Championship. We were playing a match for third place. We both lost in the semifinals. And the second game, uh, he had to go for a repetition with White. Like, he was just worse if he didn't. I had prepared it out. I, I had more time on the clock than I started with. I, I, it's it's hard to imagine somebody looking more disgusted than he looked when he repeated moves. Um, he just absolutely despised it. And uh, that bothered him, I think, more than losing in a lot of ways. Just that this is what you had to do to be a chess player. It felt that it was killing the creativity of the game. Part of it is that is part of the game. You know, part of it is how much you can learn, not how much you can create. Mm. And it just struck me that he hated that. And if you hate part of the game, you're not going to make it and you're not going to enjoy it. And I thought it really had more to do with that. Not so much that he was upset that he played badly in a couple of tournaments, but more that he understood what it would take to get better. And it was not something he wanted to spend his time doing. That description sounds a lot like a much better version of me. <laughs> yeah. Something like you, that. you two are not so different from what I know of you two, actually. Okay, guys, let's leave it there, and we are going to come back in about 15 minutes to do uh, Friday, Sunday Night at the Fights. Also, we got a book club going on. We can, we're going to have Sam back on the show to talk about his training regimen, and if you missed the first bit of this discussion, I'll post it on YouTube probably by tomorrow. Any last thoughts you guys want to leave us with? No, I'm just looking forward to getting on Twitter and seeing how much hate I'm about to get for all the stuff I've said. Yeah, you're in trouble, buddy. You're in trouble. Okay. All right. Thank you, you guys. Sorry, what? You enjoy reading Twitter, Sam? No, it's not really. Just, (laughs) you know, I want to make sure I'm staying in touch with the world. I have to tweet about my results and stuff. Does your your during tournament regimen involve not only not drinking, but also not reading Twitter during three days during the U.S. championships? I believe it or not, not only is it no Twitter, sometimes I don't even check the standings. All right. All I right. do my best to just focus exclusively on my game. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And lots of people in chat wishing that you uh, will do well in the U.S. championships. Thanks for being here, Sam. Thanks. And uh, Jesse and I will be right back, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>